Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name's Emma Gregg. I'm a travel journalist. Welcome, welcome to this session. We're going to be talking this afternoon about responsible tourism in the travel media. Um, we want to have a little discussion about whether responsible tourism stories uh, are getting as much airtime and as much column inches, as much pages as perhaps they should. Or, um, or do we feel otherwise? Is there perhaps too much emphasis on responsible tourism in the travel media? Um, we, we're going to have a little, little dis discussion about this. Um, but before I introduce my, my panel, uh, I, I'd like to, to welcome you all personally, and I'd like to find out a little bit about, about who you are. So um, do, do I have any travel media people in the audience here? Hands, travel media. Hello, welcome, Travel Media. Um, do, do I have any people here who, who work? Is this, is this sounding OK? Yeah. Do I have any people who work for travel companies or tour operators or tourism boards who would say that responsible tourism is a prime part of their, their delivery, their product, their message? A uh, show of hands, please, to you people. Quite a few. OK. Good. Um, and, and I can assume that you're all interested in responsible tourism because that's why you're here. But if, if you just like to learn about it, then that's cool too. Um, I know there's, there's lots of us here. Anybody who's like young and bendy, there's lots of space here if you want to sit. Other way. Yeah. Um, now, uh, as I say, my name's Emma Gregg. Um, my, I'm joined here by a panel, a very distinguished panel indeed, of, uh, of UK travel media. Um, this is Adrian Phillips on the left here. He is, um, your official title is MD of Brat Guides? Yes. A Adrian Phillips is MD of Brat Guides, one of the best series of guidebooks that's published in the UK. They have a completely international coverage. Um, in the middle here, we have, we have uh, Jane Dunford, who is travel editor of The Guardian newspaper in the UK. And um, finally, but not least, um, Tom Hall, who is, well, what's your official title at Lonely Planet? Editorial Director of Lonely Planet. I'm sure we all know Lonely Planet. They're absolutely everywhere. Um, so welcome to all three of you. Um, now, uh, when, when thinking about what we should talk about today, I, I started by thinking, well, I write about responsible tourism a lot as a travel journalist. Um, but, but maybe, you know, maybe the rest of us aren't entirely sure what makes a travel story a responsible travel story. Um, and, um, and as it happens, we've got, you know, a wholly inspiring backdrop to the stage that the guys here have created. My, my journalism brain here is just buzzing at all these topics, which are all over here. You've got like a whole year's worth of content just in these topics. Um, and I, I find this very exciting, but, but I know that there are people out there that they look at these topics and think, oh, oh it's all a bit, isn't it a bit dry? You know, it's, some of it's a bit, a bit negative. Um, child protection, what's that got to do with holidays? You know, holidays are fun things. Why do we care about these things as well? And I think, I, I feel that maybe because some of these topics are considered to be negative topics, maybe that's why they don't get as much coverage in the travel media as they might. That's something I think we, we might be talking about a little bit further down the line. Um, uh, and I, I know in, in my discussions with people in the, the travel business, uh, sometimes I hear that, uh, that people that run travel companies find it hard to get the message across to the travel media. Some people say that, well, the travel media isn't really listening to the responsible tourism stories. And Justin Francis, who I, I know many of you know, who, who runs responsibletravel.com, he wrote a, a blog piece on their own website recently, and he was talking about this very issue. He was saying it's, he, over the years, has found it um, uh, hard, very hard, sometimes impossibly hard, to, to, to get travel journalists and television companies and websites to listen to, to the issues. He says, it's, it's felt like we're shouting in the dark, he says. Why would anyone be keen to support responsible tourism if they're not aware that there are any negative consequences of tourism? Um, well, well, is he right? Is, is he right? Is, is it the case that the media isn't listening? Um, and if they're not, why are they not listening? Um, and I, I've certainly had some editors 
that I've had dealings with me say, say to me, um, okay, we, we've asked you to write a story about the safari, but, but don't make it too heavy. Don't talk too much about the conservation side. Don't talk about, about the, uh, the, the recycling and the grey water management plant. We just want to hear about the lions. We just want to hear about the adventure and the experience. We reckon if you inspire people to travel, they will, they will hopefully get the message that it's best to travel the right way. And um, uh, it, it's all about inspiration and not about preaching. Uh, so, I'd now like to, to turn, turn the discussion over to, to our panel, and I'd like to start by asking each of you, perhaps, to, to inspire us all with a story about uh, a book or a magazine feature or a project which, which actually is tackling responsible tourism in a forward-thinking, positive way, and Adrian, perhaps I could start with you. Crikey. Uh Inspiring everyone. This is different. I mean, Pratt as a as a company, we've we've been known historically since we started it uh, in the 70s for uh, promoting destinations that are emerging, that uh, that aren't on on the beaten track, as it were. And I have a certain sympathy with what you were mentioning earlier about people, uh, you know, worrying about sounding too preachy when it comes to to travel. In many ways, our our view has been that if you're uh, you, you know, that, that travel in itself is uh, supporting destinations, done responsibly of course, but that you don't need to be banging on to people the whole time about whether they should or shouldn't fly. Um, it needs to be a, a more nuanced debate about that, how, how that works. Um, I mean, we, we, we've, we did the first books to uh, the Balkans after the Balkans conflict, so we still have the only standalone guides to places like Kosovo and, and Serbia and, and, and Bosnia. Um, the first guide to Sierra Leone, first guide to Rwanda. These were all books that had a, a demonstrable effect on uh, their regrowth after after the uh, the tragedies they faced in their different countries. Um, so I think it's sorry that's that's not a specific example I'm giving there. It's more of a, a general philosophy about uh, our company's approach to responsible travel and what we're doing as a company to to uh, assist emerging destinations in 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 th their own growth and their own uh, you know emergence from often very difficult situations. So you would say that by choosing to publish books on destinations which other publishers haven't covered, that in itself is an act of responsible tourism reporting. Completely. And, and one of our lead authors, Philip Briggs, covers a lot of African destinations. We have a section in the book called, um, or used to have a section called Giving Back, uh, which said what people could do. He, he absolutely strongly objected to that. He said, look, people shouldn't be feeling guilty about visiting Ethiopia. They shouldn't, that shouldn't be the default position of your experience of visiting Ethiopia. Ultimately, if you're traveling somewhere, you should travel responsibility, but you're there in your leisure time. You want to be there to, to, to enjoy yourself, not to feel that you're doing worthy jobs the whole time. Now, if you want to go and visit projects within Ethiopia, they're fantastic. But equally, as long as you're traveling to uh, local communities using local services, you shouldn't feel the whole time that you have to sort of beat yourself and wear you know, sackcloth and ashes the whole time. You know, the very act of travel to some of these destinations um, is giving back. You don't need to then also give and give and give and give and back and feel guilty your whole trip. I think there's a balance mm. to be struck. Yeah, yes, no, no quite. Now, now Jane, tell me, what, what kind of examples could you like to share with us? So I think um, a lot of what The Guardian focuses on in the travel section is about low impact travel, places, going to places that um, well, the, the local people really do benefit. And one feature that we did this year, which I thought worked really well, um, was about a tour operator working to empower women in India by training them to be tour guides. And the story was told through the voice of the local people, so the women were talking about how it was really making a lot of difference to their, to their lives. And also for the people that traveled on those trips, they were getting a unique insight. And so um, those are the, we kind of try to show responsible tourism from the point of view of people that benefit as well as the people going on the holidays themselves. Mm. And do you find it hard to find topics like that? Do you find it hard to, to find those, those interesting little stories where there's a clear connection between community development and community benefit and, and an enjoyable experience for a traveller? Um, I don't think it's hard. You do have to do a bit more research, but also it's what we know that our readers like. I mean, they, they are interested in the stories which show people alternatives to the places that might be suffering from over tourism so um so we, we 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 are celebrating things from the ground up mm, good and and tom 
Um, I've got two examples, if I may. Um, mm -hmm. So, firstly, I'd, I'd echo a lot of the things that, that Adrian said about the act. that one okay um, just echo what Adrian was saying about the act of travel to many destinations being a positive thing if it's done in a way that is responsible and I think it's actually incumbent on everybody in the media to show that positive side of it and not always assume that we're starting from a negative standpoint here of there being bad things that you will experience or you going as a tourist and, uh, and visiting somewhere there is a negative impact actually mm. the upside of it is huge and I think it, it it is incumbent on all of us to stress that as much as we can um, Lonely Planet magazine recently celebrated its 100th issue um, and there was a feature in that by our deputy editor Amanda Canning about Madagascar yeah. actually um, and it was as with a lot of the features in our magazine it was immersive there was lots of very beautiful imagery it was written from thoughtful first person perspective but it, it, it touched on without going into I would say um, scientific or academic level detail about problems like deforestation, um, you know, loss of species, habitat um, uh, changes in Madagascar. And it showed how by going and choosing and traveling with the right people, you could make a positive difference. And I thought that was a very sensitive way to cover that, while also understanding that when people are reading about Madagascar, they're thinking about cuddly lemurs and rainforest and, you know, wonderful, colorful people and, and showing how all of that's there for you in a positive way. Mm. The second thing is actually a piece that was not published by Lonely Planet, and, and you touched on over-tourism. It's been a real theme of this year. I thought the way that Skift covered that by essentially giving a series of actionable suggestions for destinations that they could do about it yeah. was one of the more progressive and possibly revolutionary things I've read on that topic because mm. it didn't waste hundreds of words saying, is over-tourism a thing or isn't it? That yeah. doesn't matter. If somebody in that destination thinks that it is, then those destinations have an issue and they can do something about it. Well, here are some clear things that you can do. And some of them involve behavior change. Some mm. of them actually involve people having a better overall experience or mm. a cheap one or a more authentic one. But by taking that as an approach, again, I think you understand that responsible travel, sustainable travel issues are now baked so much into everything to do with travel and tourism. To, to make out that they're sort of sitting over here in a niche and you know I'd, I'd also really urge publishers and media not to put them in a niche not to put them in a, a separate part of their site or a, a separate regular section of a, of a magazine or in a, in a chapter of a book you bake them into everything and mm -hmm. if you're doing that well then mm. that's a lot of the challenge that you're overcoming already mm. now, now that's really interesting now that this the skift article that you just referred to do you remember the headline of it it was something like over tourism, a playbook for destinations. A, which a is plague. A play, playbook. A playbook. Um, anybody in the audience, has anybody seen this article? By, it's published in Skift. Hands up, please. Anybody who's seen this? this lady did. One lady has seen it. This Two, lady did. three, four, five. Um, a, a very small number of you. Now, the, the headline of this article, Tom assures me, sadly, I haven't seen this article, to my shame. It's a playbook for. It was something like that. A, a, a playbook for tourism. Um, if the rest of you that didn't see this article, if you had seen that headline, would you have read the article? Hands up, please. It's like maybe a quarter, because I I feel this is this is something which is incumbent on us on in the travel media. We need to make responsible tourism issues exciting. You know, as soon as you see the headline, you want to read it. Uh, if if we've done that, we've, we're doing our job right. But maybe you know what we need to to take on board is maybe we're not we're not making it exciting enough but dare I say to coin a, a ghastly phrase sexy enough we've got to try and and get people engaged in the way editorially we present these these ideas but thank you nonetheless thank you very much to all three of you for for suggesting um, some some stuff that we can all go and look at um, now I'd like to I'd, I'd like to address now the, the biggest elephant in the room when it comes to, to responsible tourism reporting, and, and that is, of course, discussion of, of um, flying and the fact that, that um, it is very hard to argue that we're responsible travellers if we're getting on planes and, and um, travelling long haul. Um, and I, 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 was, I was somewhat distressed uh, last week to see in, in one of the UK's uh, newspapers, one which I, I normally respect, um, they published an article, a travel article, about a travel blogger 
uh, who, who, who their, their game plan is basically they're, they're based in New York and, um, and every few weeks, it says in this article, every few weeks they, they jump aboard a, a plane and they make a long haul trip uh, and they stay away for a long weekend. And they're terribly, terribly proud about how quick and easy it is to, to travel long distances and, um, and, and have a really short, quick holiday. And uh, hang on, let me see if I can find a, a quote from that here. Yes, they said, um, this particular blogger, every few weeks she travels to a faraway destination like Bali or Poland or Paris or Portugal on a long weekend. Um, now, there is no mention whatsoever in this article in the unnamed newspaper that this isn't great for the environment. Um, uh, Jane, uh, what, what do you think about this uh, as, a, as, a, as a newspaper that wouldn't have published this? How, how do you feel that, that reflects on the newspaper travel writing um, industry? Well, I would think that particular article was particularly irresponsible. We um, at The Guardian, we obviously can't say don't fly. We wouldn't want to say don't fly because of all the amazing benefits that travel can bring when done the right way. But we do focus a lot more these days on covering UK holidays, so suggesting you know brilliant places you might not have heard of um, or you might not have considered going to in the UK, and also traveling by rail more. Um, we... We do less long haul, I think, than we used to, but that's not, not to say that we wouldn't we'd tell people not to fly because that's not going to happen. It might encourage people to think more about how many long haul flights they do a year, whether there are alternatives to destinations that they could consider. Um, and this is one thing we've been doing quite a lot of recently as well, is suggesting alternatives to kind of the main places and um, short haul alternatives to, you know, to long haul destinations, which they might not have thought of. Mm. Yeah, quite. And um, uh, of course you may. Yes, Tom. Um, I, 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 don't, um, I, d I don't wish to in any way disagree that, you know, the world of aviation makes an you know, undeniable contribution to carbon emissions. But I do think that there's a risk when we look at this question as a, as a travel industry that we take that as an isolated example. Mm. And we say, OK, therefore, um, everybody should fly less and seek alternatives to doing so. Well, there's an argument for that. But actually, all of this carbon in the, that's been generated in the world is coming from lots of different places. People have the opportunity to make changes throughout their whole life. Um, and if you are getting on... No, the example you gave was a very extreme example. There mm. are not many people here. I don't know, maybe you're all hopping on a long-haul flight every weekend. I'm, I'm certainly not. But if you're mm. taking, you know a smaller number of those flights and you're seeking alternatives. I, I would say that's probably normal um, and, I, and I think that's okay. I, I hate the idea that the media is really castigating its audience in mm. some ways when there are a lot of complex parts to that question. Um, so in, in a way it's, it, it is something to look at but I think it's a broader question. Mm, sure. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And the other worry I have about focusing in an unnuanced way on air travel and saying, look, you should avoid all air travel, is that that means that you're restricting the field for most people to travel, and that restricted field happens to be to more westernized, often rich destinations. So you're effectively saying to people, Get a, go everywhere by rail, and therefore you're on a tight leash here, and you're effectively saying abandon those destinations further away. They're very frequently the very ones that require that, that support from tourism. Mm. Um, I also think there's a, there's a danger of, of making travel into a class-based issue as well, or, or certainly an economically-based uh, issue, because those who can afford to travel slowly a long way need to put a, long, a lot of time aside for that. And a great many people have their, you know, most people have their one week or two weeks that they need to take, and they just can't afford that time to be able to travel in that way. So we, I think it's more important to think about um, where you're traveling and what you're doing. And, and, and certainly the example you gave there of that article is absolutely not how to travel by air. But just because you travel by air doesn't mean you're doing something wrong, and indeed it doesn't mean you can't be doing something very positive. Yes, no, I, I quite agree, and of course we wouldn't all be in this industry if we felt that travelling by air was was categorically a bad thing. I guess it's a matter it's a matter of proportion and of spending uh, longer in the destination once you've flown there. And I think it's important that the travel media is is realistic about how it presents 
its ideas and, and was responsible in itself about the fact that the articles it, it produces are, uh, ultimately they're going to be aspirational and this particular article was offering an aspiration which just seems, seems inappropriate. Um, I'd now like to move on to the, the other big hot topic, which has been discussed a lot here at World Travel Market already, quite rightly so. Um, it's it's over-tourism, because it's been discussed a lot. Please please stay with me. This this is this is just one of these things I think we really have to have to tackle. And and this is something as well that I'd love to talk with you a bit about about um, Jane, because I I love I loved that headline that the Guardian rang recently. It it was it was um, the one about Amsterdam. It was Amsterdamers versus tourists. It's worst when they throw up in your plant box. Now that is a headline that will get you reading, isn't it? Come on. So well done, Guardian. Thank you. <laughs> was, it, was that your I'd like headline? To say it was, but it wasn't my headline. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But um, in general, what, what's your take on on um, reporting on over tourism? Uh, do you feel it's 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 a newspaper's job? To, to offer both sides of the story, the, the tourist side as well as the angry local side? Mm. Well, I think it's the, um, a journalist's job to report, the, report on what is actually happening. So, so yes, we try and present an objective view and um, we're writing for readers, people who might be thinking of going to those places, but we're giving a voice also to the local people who might have had these issues, you know, like tourists throwing up in their gardens or, or whatever. Um, and I think we have a space and a certain amount of space dedicated to just reporting stories like this. We also have other sections within the paper which, so it's covered not just in the travel section, there's sort of, you know, global development, cities, there's other areas where these sort of issues are, are covered. And travel, we focus more on providing the, the sort of the positive um, the positive examples of, of how you can travel well. And so we might suggest again going to an alternative to Amsterdam. Um, just, just giving people sort of information on which to base their choices. Maybe behavioral tips, but it's again, it's risking. You don't want to become preachy. I think that becoming preachy and sort of sounding holier than now is just a way to turn people off. Mm. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I actually think that the, the very nature of the travel media lends itself to offering answers to this question. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose if I think about in newspapers, you will often see something like new restaurants in Paris, thus encouraging people who may have already been to Paris to return to Paris, talking about developments in popular cities, finding ways to disperse people around Venice, Barcelona, Paris, wherever, is one of the solutions to this, so you don't have everybody concentrated in one place. And, it, and I don't want to speak for Adrian, but I would say certainly in terms of Lonely Planet's priorities when we're going into destinations and researching them, is to show people how they can have equally, if not superior, experiences than going to the real honeypot attractions in a particular place. Mm. While at the same time understanding that everyone who goes to Venice wants to go to St. Mark's and, and, and okay, what's a good time of day to do that? Is there a different way, take you can have on that? Mm. Um, with guidebooks, you have a little more room to breathe on that subject. You've got a little more space. You can go into a bit more detail. Um, same with online. But, uh, but I think that the problems of over tourism can be solved in part through the media, but I think they are, they are made, unfortunately, by other sections of the travel industry who are responding to demand but yeah. sending people to similar places at similar times. And with someone like Venice, there's only so, there's only so much space to go around. Mm. And there you have the problem, and it's an understandable one. And of course, as, tra as travel journalists, if we're lucky, then we should have the opportunity to research the places which are just a little bit off the beaten track in these honeypots destinations. I will tirelessly, tirelessly seek out new options in Venice for you. Yes, good. Right, thank you very much. I'm very glad to hear Guide, that. The, the, it's quite interesting. I was speaking to a travel editor of a big broadsheet uh, newspaper recently, and he said, we can never have too much Spain. And there is this problem that um, inherently 
either the newspaper is leading that interest in Spain or it's reflecting a broader interest in Spain. I think yes. you know, the view on the newspaper side is that they're reflecting a broader interest and that will encourage people to buy them. Um, I write for newspapers and magazines as well as, as, as the publishing side. Um, and as an example, I've got a piece that I wrote on Samoa that I filed over a year ago and which still hasn't run because they haven't been able to find the necessary advertising to accompany that. Mm. Whereas if I file a piece on Spain, it can run in a week. Uh, and it's definitely that, that issue of breadth of coverage within, within certain newspapers, certainly not Jane's of course, but, but in certain uh, other ones and, and that difficulty for them commercially in navigating and, and allowing for that spread of content and coverage. Mm. Mm, yes, yeah, thank, thank you very much, Adrian. Um, now, uh, because the previous session overran, I'm mindful that we had to start a little bit late. I'm very sorry for that. Um, but there is a little bit of time for questions. So I would like to ask if anybody's got a question for our panel, or indeed for me, please, please put up your paw. Oh, well, thank, thank you, Harold. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Adrian, I just disagree a little bit with what you were saying about not including um, good things to do when you travel because with the carbon that you already know you're using, people also feel good when they get there to give back in a certain way. So I don't think that should be something you should exclude. No, so I, I didn't mean we exclude that by any means. I mean, we, our, our books have arguably, I, I won't speak for, for Tom, but more stuff on responsible travel woven through the book than any other side book publisher, probably. Um, it was more about the message in which you frame it. You know, you call it giving something back. It's almost suggesting inherently that, that prior to that, you're acting negatively. Uh, and, and as Tom said earlier, there needs to be the shift of mindset that doesn't suggest that the very act of travel and the default position is a negative act and that you therefore have to give something back to a destination. The act of traveling there in itself is a positive thing or can be a positive thing. Um, mm. that, that's yeah, uh, this is Nitin from India. I appreciate the efforts that you're taking. But somewhere I feel the word safety is missing. With the amount of selfie deaths that we are facing, I'm from a media company. We have started an initiative by name Traveler Be Safe. If any unfortunate incidents happen in a destination, so we start reminding that destination with that unfortunate instant. So somewhere I feel request that even safety should be included for all the travel writers when they write about the travel. So to what extent are you contributing in spreading safety in tours, which is very critical now? Jane, maybe this is one for you. Um, in terms of destinations that we cover, we'd only send people or, or, or write articles about places that we feel are safe to, to travel to. Um, and I think just from you know, the person who's writing the article, they're talking about how they've experienced it and they'll be going to places which are safe for tourists. I think, I'm not sure whether that answers your question or, or not. See, my question is safety, not destination specific. It is theme specific. What safety to be taken? See, unfortunately, you go to the end of the cliff of the mountain and you try to take a selfie and lose a life. So that awareness has to be spread. Um, I, I think the, if you think a little about the risks that travelers put themselves in when they're exploring a destination, I think you're correct to say that at least part of the responsibility to give people up-to-date advice wherever you can rests with the media, and part of it rests with the individual. Um, that is a, an ongoing challenge. You know, Every single day, we'd be making changes to our website to reflect advice and information as is relevant to do so. Um, and some of that is about people using their common sense as well. 